With all the marketing and pre-hype for films and television shows, it can be hard to really surprise people in this day and age. By the time the project even gets screened, you can feel like you've seen all of the major plot points thanks to trailers. Yet, every once in a while, much like greeting the postman at the door in a bilateral mesh thong, a different type of package than the one you expected can turn heads. So let's take a look at some TV shows that weren't exactly a la carte. I'm Jules from WhatCulture.com and these are 10 TV shows that were nothing like you'd expect. Number 10. Buffy the Vampire Slayer Nowadays, you pretty much only think of the TV show when Buffy is mentioned, but at the time of the original release of the teenager slasher on the telly, the movie that came out five years earlier was still in the mind of many. As a result, anyone expecting the campy, silly and more comedy vibe of the film would have been caught completely off guard as this TV show was darker, smarter, more action-packed and on a completely different level quality-wise. Yet still, the marketing for this was also inconsistent to the final product as it over-egged the horror elements. Thankfully, the end result was much, 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 MUCH better than anything that came before or what was promised to be. I sounded like a discount wise man there, sorry about that. Number 9. Frasier Cheers is one of the ultimate hangout sitcoms. It was friends before friends was friends. The premise was relatively simple, the main crux being a bunch of people chilling in a bar and talking, with little irony or snark but a lot of heart and charm. It wasn't particularly dumb or lowbrow, but it certainly had a broad comic appeal. Imagine, then, how jarring it is to go from that to Frasier. While fans were familiar with the character after his introduction in the third season, and him then becoming a mainstay for over 200 episodes, his spin-off show couldn't really be any more different. Rather than a hangout, this time it's mostly just a band of three players, Frazier, his brother Niles and their dad Martin, and the comedy is decidedly cerebral. Offering a mix of intellectual wit and high fast, it's every bit as winning as Cheers' humour, but nothing like it at the same time. It's the type of humour that we at What Culture try desperately to avoid. After all, I've built an empire on the backs of your mothers, much like in the same fashion the porn industry did back in the 70s. There's my full bushed one per list. Number 8. The Office US version. American versions of British sitcoms rarely go well, and the US office proves both the rule and then went on to become the exception to it. Starring Steve Carell in the David Brent type role, the first season suffered by trying to be almost shot for shot, word for word, the exact same as the UK version, which begged the question what the hell the point of it was. However, season two turned that concept around and pushed it down the stairs into a dirty warehouse. Here Steve came into his own, the characters were shaped differently and the romantic relationships began to form. It took some of the UK version's best elements but twisted them to fit rather than offering a pale imitation of, with Michael Scott being more childlike, less mean-spirited and more purely lovable than David Brent. It became an absurd satire of the American workplace, which when you say it out loud seems rather obvious, like it should have been trying to hit that from the off, right? Number 7. The Defenders Phase 1 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe isn't perfect, if we're being honest. Iron Man 2 is amongst the worst MCU offerings out there, and, you know, even despite Mickey Rourke's laughable where's my board line, you know, it, it, it is pretty bad. However, when we're looking at the Avengers project as a whole, it is absolutely incredible. The Defenders, then, was supposed to be a Netflix Marvel Universe's version of the Avengers, all of the heroes we've been following for the last couple of years finally coming together in a much-anticipated team-up, even if the path there was slightly rocky at times. But then, instead of a true event, it takes three hours for the Defenders to even begin teaming up, and I hate to say this, it's a bit boring. The worst thing about it was that it never really gives them a good reason to team up, and as a result, the expectation versus delivery on this was a bit lackluster. It's a real shame. Number 6. Game of Thrones Nowadays, Game of Thrones is a pop culture behemoth that will destroy anything in its path, whether it be ratings, records, or Emmy contenders. Back in 2011, though, it was a rather different proposition, and unless you were familiar with George R. R. Martin's novels, it wasn't entirely clear what we could expect from the show. While HBO suggested something prestige, one of the more common and layman terms description of the shows you'd hear was that it was like Lord of the Rings but with sex. That's so off the mark, though. In its current season, yes, the magical elements are there and the Lord of the Rings battles are a coming, but back then it was a war of words as much as it was with swords. The trailers, meanwhile, didn't fully capture just how thrilling and captivating it would be. Indeed, the season one trailer looks really generic and even a tad dull, and the posters made Ned Stark look like a brooding anti-hero, and everyone except the book readers thought that Sean Bean was playing THE main character. Oh, how wrong they were. Number 5. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend 
a romantic musical dramedy with the title Crazy Ex-Girlfriend airing on the CW network of hot young things and soapy teen dramas and with a trailer that solely seemed to emphasise the rom-com Ex-Girlfriend Wants Her Boyfriend Back elements, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is an entirely different product to that which was advertised. While the show does include romance, musical numbers and comedy, it's also a surprisingly and increasingly dark look at mental illness, but also a very considered exploration of it as well. It also looks at female sexuality from a decidedly female point of view, along with themes of parenthood which combine to make this show as serious and affecting as it is hilarious and full of show tunes. Number 4. The OA Netflix deliberately kept the OA mysterious in the build-up to releasing the eight-episode first season, but even then it managed to defy any and all expectations. The basic premise was that there was a previously blind girl who returns home after being missing for seven years and her sight has returned. It'd be fair to think then that it would explore the mystery of what happened to her and how she got her sight back, but the OA didn't stop there or do anything in a conventional way. The first episode alone suggested as much, with the opening credits not rolling until the 55-minute mark. That told us that this was not a normal TV show. From there, we were plunged into stories within stories, alternate dimensions, questions to the fabric of reality, a school shooting, and, at the very heart of the series, what amounts to interpretive dance. It's baffling, beguiling, and unlike anything else around. Number 3. Gotham the elevator pitch of Gotham is that it depicts the titular city before Batman came along, with a focus on Jim Gordon's early days in the Gotham City Police Department. Now that makes it sound like a plain old procedural set within the Batman world, with a few villains popping up and gradually building to Bruce Wayne's transformation. And true, early episodes do fit with that brief, especially with the focus on the straight-laced Gordon. However, no one could have predicted just how completely ball-bag crazy this Batman series would become, nor how the true focus would be on its villains. This series has done away with expectations and is very content on doing what it wants, flying in the face of purists. It doesn't always hit the mark, but god damn was it unafraid to mess with expectations. Number 2. Better Call Saul Breaking Bad was a high-octane thriller of a show, with a propulsive plot that left you gripped episode after episode. Following up on one of the greatest TV shows ever to be made is no small feat. And no one expected Better Call Saul to be as good as Breaking Bad, but they did at least anticipate something similar, although maybe with a little bit more comedy as well. While Saul does increasingly have some Breaking Bad elements, especially thanks to Mike and now Gus, in terms of the main plot, they are worlds apart. Where Breaking Bad was driven by plot and about a million things happening every episode, Saul takes the opposite approach. This drama is largely focused around the gradual descent of Jimmy McGill and is slow-paced and deliberate, with it often seeming like nothing is happening in each individual episode, and yet, everything is really happening. It does have its funny moments, but ultimately it's a more tragic show than Breaking Bad. That told the story of a man corrupted by power and greed. This is simply the sad story of a person who tried to be good, only to repeatedly fail and be told that he wasn't good enough. Breaking Bad was exciting, but Better Call Saul will break your heart. And number 1. Twin Peaks The Return for 25 years, Twin Peaks fans wondered what fate had befallen Agent Dale Cooper. The man of pure goodness and integrity had, at the end of season 2, seemingly became twinned with the malevolent Bob. But that's where the story was left. So when Showtime announced the revival of the show, with David Lynch returning as the main creative force, answers were expected. It seemed likely that Cooper would return, and Twin Peaks would be, well, Twin Peaks. Of course, that underestimated the warped mind of Lynch, who instead of the damn fine coffee and cherry Pie Town gave us nightmarish creatures in New York, talking trees, Michael Cera doing a Marlon Brando impression, and a black and white hellscape of such sonically and visually distorting fury it needs to be seen to be believed. But most of all, he gave us Bad Cooper, the complete antithesis of the hero we'd known and loved. It was unlike anything else we'd seen from Twin Peaks, and yet by the end completely fitted as a missing piece of the jigsaw, and something even arguably better than the original run, and I do not say that lightly. 